to, in order to return what we want, in order to return something besides that, we're going to have to kind of play a little trick on the framework. What we're going to do is we're going to provide our own, we're going to, we're going to write our own provider, and we're going to say we know how to do MD5. And we're going to register ourselves at the first place in the list. But we're not going to actually return an MD5 hash. We're actually going to implement something better. We're going to implement SHA-1 or SHA-2. Um, so this is what that would look like. The provider itself uh, is, is actually really straightforward. So any provider has to extend java.security.provider. But all java.security provider is is a hash table, um, which all it does is map uh, a name to a class. So all we have to do in here is say, uh, you know, what, what particular algorithm we want to, to, to fake out. So in this case, like, it's the, the, the first, the first uh, part of it is the, is the type, so message digest, and the last part of his name. Message digest.md5, I want to map to this new implementation class I'm going to write, my fake MD5 implementation. Now all we have to do, once this, this is it, this is done, um, when, and once you, once you put this in the uh, Java security file, that's it. Now, oh, except for actually writing my fake MD5 implementation. The, the obvious thing we'd want to do here is just extend from one of the, one of the predefined uh, good classes. So if you wanted it to be, uh, let's say, SHA-2, you would just uh, derive a class from SHA-2 and have it say it's MD5. That would be great. Unfortunately, at least the, the Sun-provided uh, implementations are, are marked as final, so you can't extend from that. A little unfortunate, but it's OK. A minor, minor bump in the road. What we're going to do instead is, uh, again, we have to implement from message digest SPI, so we do that. Um, and then just call the provider framework to get the, the, the one we want. So, I mean, just, just like the app was doing. Say, message digest instance SHA or get instance SHA2, and it works fine. Um, and this happens all the time for, for less weird reasons than what we're doing right now, which is to, to, to psych out the framework. This happens all the time, like, um, like maybe a signature algorithm would need access to a hash or, or something like that. So it's, this is a very, very, very common thing to do. Uh, so once you, once you get the object you want, use it. You can chain them if you want to. So if you had like, uh, you know, MD5 chains to SHA-1, chains to SHA-2, although I would say like, if, if you're, and I, like, don't use this as long term. If you've kept this in place so long that the next algorithm on your list is also vulnerable, you, you probably have much, much bigger problems. Uh, it, you can also, uh, you also have to watch out for circularity issues. So don't have MD5 redirect to SHA-1, redirect to MD5, redirect to SHA-1, or you're going to get into a lot of trouble. Um, all right, so that's about it for the JCA provider framework. Uh, what's going to happen in C and G is uh, similar to JCA, but somewhat less flexible, unfortunately. Um, so you write up your custom provider. But there's no, there's no real analog. We had that, we had that really, really easy, cool way in, uh, um, in JCA to just go into the java.security file and make changes. That's not there in CNG. In, uh, in CNG, these things get stored in the registry. Uh, but word back from, uh, from the team is that you should never, ever, ever go into the registry and start, start messing with those by hand because you'll corrupt your system. You always want to use the CNG SDK to do that type of thing, which means you have to do it programmatically. So right off the bat, it's, it's, it's a little more of a pain since you have to do it programmatically. Now, we had that programmatic option back in JCA, uh, which I said not to use. And that was, um, uh, it was not, I, actually, I, I probably forgot to tell you that. When you do this in JCA, the changes are not persistent. So you do it programmatically, but it only lasts for the lifetime of the app. Um, that's, that's not the way it works in CNG. You do it programmatically, and it actually, it, it stays around forever. So that's slightly better, but again, it, it's, it's still not a great solution. Plus, you can only specify whether you want it at the top or the bottom. And in, in JCA, you say what, whatever particular place you wanted to put it, it would put it just fine. Now you have your choice of the top or the bottom. And you can reorder, but seriously, no, no one's going to go to the trouble of, of doing all the reordering. Um, so again, remember, the, remember what the implementation has to look like. You have to implement bcrypt hash interface uh, to do the get hash interface, and then implement all the, all the methods to fill out the bcrypt hash function table. Um, once you've done that, here's what registration looks like. You uh, create up a structure for the crypt rep provider reg um, called bcrypt register provider with the name of it to register it as provider. Then add context function provider to say what kind of uh, functionality that it actually supports. So 
pretty, pretty similar if, if I have to give the edge to, to JCA in terms of usability and flexibility. Oh, and, and again, avoid this, avoid this in, uh, in CNG. Uh, just, just like in JCA where you can name specific providers, you can do the same thing here, but you, you don't want to because it, 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 totally, uh, it totally defeats the purpose of agility. Just pass, so for the third argument to crypt open algorithm provider, always just pass null so that the agility features of the framework are engaged. All right, I saved .NET for last here because it works vastly differently than the other two. What happens in .NET is that it, it, .NET isn't meant to have like multiple different classes of the same of the same implementation of the same algorithm. It, it, it's it's not meant to work like there's no there's no framework that just iterates through saying can you do this no can you do this no can you do this yes okay then I take this one. What happens is if you're if you're if you've written .NET in an agile way to say to use the factory methods. What happens is uh, the framework goes to the machine config, which is the, 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 the one top level global config file on the system. And it looks in this for a mapping for this algorithm. It says, okay, what, when someone asks for this string MD5, what is it that I should instantiate? Sounds similar to the other two, but there's a subtle but incredibly significant difference. And the other two, it was the providers themselves that understood what they supported. So this provider knows what, that it can do MD5. This provider knows that it can do SHA2. In .NET, the, the providers don't know that. There's no, like the, the strings of whatever the algorithm is isn't hard coded into it. All they know is that they're a hash algorithm or they're a symmetric algorithm or they're a whatever. The upshot to this, and it's, it's totally controlled by this machine config file. The upshot for us here is that we can reconfigure that config file to remap the algorithms without ever having to write those, those dummy provider wrappers like we had to do in the other two. So that's really significant, that it's controlled, the mapping is completely controlled by the config file and not at all controlled by the inherent code in the provider. So this is all you'd have to do. Um, open up your machine config. Uh, you'd see a section in here under MS Corelib cryptography settings called name entry. And here is just where you'd put that string that you're passing in in the code. And you'd say what class you want it to map to. In this case, I'm going to call it my preferred hash. This is not like a, a C sharp class or anything like that. It's just, it's a crypto class that you see in the next section down. And there you're going to say what the strong name of the class that you want to implement whenever somebody calls this particular method. So when somebody says MD5, it's going to actually instantiate a SHA-512 CNG object. But this whole thing, this whole idea of asking for MD5 and getting back SHA-1 or getting back SHA-2 is very, very dangerous. It seems like a really good thing, doesn't it? I mean, we know MD5 is broken. We, 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 we're, we're afraid something could be broken in the future. We want this ability. As security guys, we want this ability for someone, when someone asks for something bad, we want the ability to say, no, 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 you don't really want that. You really want this. This is better for you. Do it. The problem is, un unless they were specifically designed for it, the app's probably not going to be able to, to handle this. It's going to be, it's going to have expected MD5, and it's going to break in really weird ways. And if you're debugging it, man, can, can you imagine how difficult it would be to debug that? You'd be stepping through the line of code, and you're like, what is going on here? I, I just declared an MD5 object, and I got back SHA-1. My system is screwed up. That would be, that would be very, very difficult to, to debug. And, and what's worse than that is that the kind of changes we're making, we're making changes to the global level machine config. We're making changes to java.security and CNG. These are, these are widespread, system-wide changes we're making. You make a change to machine.config, you're going to affect every .NET app on that system. Make a change to Java security, you're going to affect all the Java apps on the system. If you make a change to CNG, you're probably not only going to affect the other, or the other applications that are using CNG, you're going to affect the other ones too. Because we, we, at least the .NET ones, a lot of the implementations there are just pass-throughs to CNG. So, all over the place, stuff like maybe, maybe you had the one app you intended to work, but you just broke 10 other apps on the system. So again, I don't, think, I don't think this pattern we're talking about is useless. I think it has some use under extreme circumstances in extreme cases when you don't have access to the source code or you're just unwilling to make changes to the source code. For the rest of the time, I want to talk about what we can do 
with access to the source code, we're writing an app from scratch so that it's, it's more secure from the start, so that it's expected, so we can do this type of thing and it won't break. Better, better ways to do this. One step, one thing you can do, is just to avoid these default algorithm names altogether. Don't use, don't use MD5, don't use AES. Instead, make unique names for each type of cryptographic operation for each particular application. So you'd have something like this. In .NET app, you'd have something like application foo, preferred hash, or application bar, preferred cipher, application foo, preferred digest, whatever. So that every, everything you can possibly do in any given app has its own entry into the provider framework. Um, this is great. What you could do with this, you could make changes to any particular one, and you know you're not going to step on any other app. You know that I want to change this this one, great, I changed this this one. All the other ones remained exactly the way they were. Very, very cool. Unfortunately, only really practical to do in .NET, because only in .NET can you just go make changes to the machine config. And every other one you have to write custom wrappers. And I mean, even the, like, even the most uh, you know, die-hard security guy isn't going to say, I want you to write a custom wrapper for every operation, for every application to be installed on every user machine in the event that someone breaks RSA someday. I think that's probably asking a lot. Um, so reasonable and practical to do in .NET, not so much the other two. What's another better uh, idea here? Well, pull it from a configuration store. So just you know, any kind of configuration file or database, any place you want to do, uh, just pull the algorithm name for that. Easy to change. Uh, a better alternative, but there's some pros and cons here. So um, let's look at both. So if you want, if you want to do, if you want to go the, the unique provider name route, um, the pros, well, security to do this is already part of the system. You have to have special permissions to go edit the machine config file. And we, fig we figure if, if you're privileged enough to do that, then you're privileged enough to, to reconfigure the cryptography on, on the system. Um, Cons, well, it's probably prohibitive in terms of implementation costs, unless, unless it's .NET. Exactly the opposite for the config store. Pros is that it's much, much easier to implement this kind of thing, but the cons are you're going to have to remember to secure the store. And, and that's kind of a critical piece, right? You just put this in a configuration file on the system that anybody can go edit. Well, someone's going to edit you down. You thought you had strong crypto, and now you don't because you, you forgot to ackle that, that, uh, that configuration store. So if you're going to go this route, and you, you probably do if you're using CNG or JCA, remember to secure that store where you're holding your algorithm names. All right, well, it's time for demo. Maybe, maybe it's just that easy. Let's find out. So um, I've got an app here. It, it, really doesn't, uh, it really doesn't do anything. I'll show you in a second. Um, what you can do is, uh, is log into it. That, that, that's really all it needs to do. So I'm going to log in, and I'm going to register because I don't have an account, and my username is Brian. My email is brian at brian.com. My password is password. Create a user. Great, I've logged in. Fantastic. Let's take a look at what that did under the cover. So drop this down a little bit so you can read a little more. Um, Basically, this app here, I have, I have two functions that have any meaning um, in, the, in the membership provider uh, code behind this. So I'm going to validate a user, so I'm going to check their password, um, and I'm going to create a user. Um, and in both these cases, I'm not storing the password in plain text, because we all know that's horrible. I'm going to store a hash of that. So here's the way the code, the way it sits right now. Um, completely non-agile. Um, this, is, this is C sharp, so I've, uh, I've instantiated a particular uh, Algorithm MD5, a particular implementation of that algorithm, which is the CSP. Um, and I've just nude up one of those objects and started using it. So we all know that's horrible. We're not going to do this anymore. So I'm going to uh, stop debugging this. I'm going to comment this out. We're going to go to a much more agile method, what I was showing you before. So I declare just the, the abstract hash algorithm. Say, I'm going to create crypto agility demo preferred hash, a unique name for this particular application. I have to do this in two places, one for validating and one for creating. Great. Now I'm going to rebuild. Now I have to, I have to uh, tell machine config what uh, 
crypto agility demo my preferred hash is.